Quite frankly, Mr. Holt, we're a little concerned about Travis. He's been getting into fights in class. Owen Stevens called him a chicken, and Travis attacked the boy. Mr. Holt has been my experience in the past that the easiest way to handle these things is to nip it in the bud. Mr. Holt, are you listening to me? Mr. Holt! Are you saying that this is my boy's fault? You listen here, pal. Nobody calls my kid a chicken. Least of all, not some little sissy like Owen Stevens. This old man was a sissy back in school. Now he's a little sissy. Mr. Holt, I was simply saying that Travis is- Sorry, I'm like Some idiot cut me off in traffic. What'd I miss? Dad, they're calling my boy a hothead. You calling my boy's boy a hothead? If we can all just calm down. Calm it down for sissy. You can tell him, Travis. Go ahead and flip the desk, son. Yeah, do it, Dad. Holt, rule! <laughs> just heard uh, one of our teenagers say, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> uh, those of us that are a little older, we know that it has a lot to do with a lot. I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday. We were talking about the way, um, we're, specifically we were talking about the way that we discipline our kids uh, and how, you know, uh, we kind of had a way that it was modeled for us, the way that we were disciplined, and it was kind of our our launching pad on the way we started disciplining our kids and we figure out along the way what actually is you know what is actually good for our kids and and what's maybe not good and good for our own soul even and and so I think a lot of times the way we learn to do relationships is based off good or bad on the way that we were taught to do relationships or it was modeled for us as we were a kids and so um, that, that video is a really great representation of, of how it is for a lot of us. Uh, I, I want to return to the scriptures real quick as we get into this last part of our relationship series. And if we look in Colossians chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul writes here in verse 12, he says, Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you remember the lord forgave you so you must forgive others above all clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from christ rule in your hearts for as members as one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful and these are such a great guidelines that that paul gives to us as we're conducting our relationships uh, you know, none of this, none of these things matter if we were just on planet, the planet Earth by ourselves. Clothing ourselves in mercy, kindness, humility, and gentleness, and patience. What does that matter if we're on planet Earth all by ourselves? All of this is equipment on how to do relationships. And so, Scripture is full of wisdom, and today we're here to, to learn more about that wisdom through the experience of some of my friends here. Uh, and so we, we've asked uh, all these couples to be a part of this panel today, and we've asked you to text in your relationship questions over the last few weeks, and so you've done that. We, we've not been able to get to all the questions. Uh, we could just be here for you know two or three hours answering all the questions. So we've kind of narrowed it down to just a few, and, uh, and, and hopefully we're going to be able to have time to get through the ones that we've planned today. And so if you're married, this is relevant. If you're single, this is relevant. If you're a young person, this is relevant. If you consider yourself to be an old person, uh, this is relevant. No matter where you are in life, this is all relevant because life means nothing without relationships and you've got to know how to do them well. Amen? Amen. 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 We're all on the same page. So we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, let me just first, you guys introduce yourselves real quickly. Let's just start down here and we'll tell us, and t tell us how long you've been married and then maybe what your child situation is. His name is Robbie. <laughs> Sorry, <no. laughs> Thank you, Lowell. <laughs> I thought that was God at first, but then I was like, no, that was Lowell's voice, his accent. As Lowell said, uh, my name is Robbie Brown, and this is my wife, Lindsay. We've been married for just over five years, and we have a 
newborn daughter who is three months, three months old. All That's right. What is her name? Cadence Olivia. <laughs> yes. I'm Casey, and this is my husband, Joe, and we've been married. This is why you didn't want to do the introduction, isn't it? <laughs> It'll be 18 years this June, and we have a 14-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old daughter. All right. J.D. and Jamie Swilly, we've got three kids, 16-year-old uh, girl, 13-year-old boy, 10-year-old girl. We've been married for 20 years this year, so not yet, but coming up. Hey, okay, hey. <laughs> Dean and Renee Lukevic, we have been married 24 years. Yay! Yeah, 25 this year in December. We have one son, Caleb, and we have a brand new baby granddaughter. Yes. Yes. Well, Murphy, yes, too, of course. <laughs> Joanna Renee and Murphy is our daughter-in-law. Yeah. My name is Lowell, and this is my wife, Camille. We have three daughters. Marielle is here today, yay. She's uh, 19, and we have a 21-year-old and a 23-year-old, and she's not here today. Uh, most of you know her. She's Madison and, um, and Tyler, one of your own. Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, we've been married 24 years this April 15th, tax day. But it was Easter weekend when we got married, so that's what made it special. And JD, I feel kind of like I'm betraying my company. Oh, sorry, sorry, Lowell. It, it's hey, not your brand of water. That's spiritual, though, right? Sorry, I'm holding someone else's water. Okay, that should be. You know, we'll fit that in. You fit that in when it's your turn, okay. anyway. <laughs> here, uh, first question that we're going to go right here, next door to my wife here. Um, Jamie, sometimes, here's this question, sometimes it feels like I have to choose between my spouse and my kids. What do I do? Um, so typically, for moms, a lot of times that's the issue. More than dads, we have a tendency to want to like stand in the gap between the dad who's disciplining and our kids. Um, I have to constantly go back to the idea that the kids would not exist if it wasn't for this relationship first. And there will come a day that the kids won't be in our home. And so um, I think it's really important to keep that in perspective when you feel yourself as a mom ebbing towards your kids. Remind yourself that you're supposed to be a unified front with your husband. And there's going to be times um, that you may even disagree with the decision that's been made wait until the kids are gone out of the room away or you go away to discuss like hey that's maybe not how i would have handled that um there's been times that we've had to go back to our kids and say we made a mistake in that let's try this again um but really just rem remind yourself that they're a product of your love right and so this this relationship is the most important relationship in your home outside of obviously god but um this needs to be the staple the mainstay of your home yeah. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay. You all agree, nice I guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, here's another question. Do you ever get tired of each other? Uh, what do you do? Uh, Joe, I'm going to pitch that to you. Here. There you go. Yeah, I had to study on this one because uh, this is actually a test on our relationship. This isn't really a panel, and I'm going to pay dividends. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so my uh, my answer is I wanted the definition of the word tired. I think in our culture we kind of think of things one way, maybe from a relationship you might want to think of it differently. So tired in the dating scene, or if you're dating someone, you get tired of them, and you don't really feel like that's working out. They bore you, or they're not spiritually there for you, or they're not they're emotionally there for you. Delete them from your relationship life and be a friend maybe, but not romantically engaged. If you're getting tired in the dating scene, yowzer, because it's only going to get worse. Uh, completely. <laughs> it is. And define the word worse. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. kidding. I'd like to define the word worse now. Um, because if you're not building on a firm foundation, marriage is only going to test you in that. It's yeah, only going to magnify uh, anything. I, I used to joke that why you get married is the worst trait to that person that you fall in love with, not the best. Everybody loves the best parts of this person. You see those weak points and you start to see, wow, I really love that about that person. I can stand those things. 
And that's also where God puts you with that person. Yeah, it's totally true. If you think you can't stand it before, it's only going to magnify. You get to see it without makeup. You get to see it without posture and poise. And so you as, as a person need to realize you're in love with their traits, good and bad, and you get to own all of those. So let's say you are growing, air quote, tired. I like to use the word weary. You're growing weary of certain parameters. My wife happens to be a very huggy, loving, wonderful human being, and I am not any of those things. And so I can grow weary that she wants to hug, and I really don't enjoy hugging. I don't find it, it, it builds me up, it, it drains my energy. So is that, and you all laugh, it's totally true stuff. And my, some of you introverts may feel this way. Um, some in the church is actually you're expending a lot of energy hugging. Um, it's totally true, <laughs> let's be honest. So in your relationship, are you growing tired of them or is it really about you? Is it that you are being selfish, that you have desires and needs that you believe that person's supposed to fulfill? Oh, that's good. And last I checked, God's supposed to fulfill those things for you. You should be on, your eyes should be on him. And he gave you this other person. As I think about it, two rough rocks tumbling together, smooth each other out. God gave me her so that she can smooth me out as much as I can help smooth out some of her pits and, and spots, which I don't see any of anymore. And, I only see it through God's eyes. Um, <laughs> so that's really what I would say about that. Make sure you're growing weary in the right places. And if you're in an abusive relationship, none of this stands. That is not what I'm speaking to. I'm right. speaking about a loving, God-based relationship. Right. Put God first. If you're in an abusive relationship, that is a whole other to- topic, yeah. and I don't think that's what I was trying to consider. Right. No, All right. That was good. That was really good. It, I keep coming back. <laughs> you ready to go home? Yeah. I, I keep coming back to this quote uh, that we heard a few weeks ago that like marriage isn't about making you happy. It's about making you holy. Not that you can't, not that those two things are exclusive. You have to help choose between one or the other. I think you can have both. But there's going to obviously be times in all of our relationships where we're just not happy. But it's not... The, the other person's job in the relationship to make you happy. That's not what relationship is all about. And so that's a good reminder, Joe. Thank you. Anybody else? We good? Well, um, let's, let's move on to the next question here. It says, can a married person have a close friend of the opposite sex? Now, we might have some varying um, opinions on this panel. I'm, I'm anxious to see. But Camille, Lowell, why don't you guys speak to this? I mean, I know that's like very debatable because I know a lot of you guys have like best boyfriends or whatever that aren't romantically, but you know, porcupines aren't meant to be pet. So with that, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to leave that there anyway. (laughs) So, I mean, it's true, right? Because you can, if you're not married, you know, eventually you may have some kind of romantic feeling for them and uh but if you are married that's still a no-no it's definitely a no-no yeah. because someone's going to end up getting hurt um and end up going to be in your spouse so um be like joseph and flee you know temptation is not a sin it's uh just it's a warning sign it should be a caution light so what do you think um yeah we had talked about this obviously but I think, too, like I know for myself and my work atmosphere, you know, I think so there has to be boundaries within, yeah. like Will yes. said, you know. And so outside of that, you know, with work, there's clear boundaries that you have to set forth where people know that can't be crossed. Because um, I work closely with men, but those boundaries are clear. And yeah. when the door, when I leave at that hour, there's no other conversations. And so there's no social media, there's none of those outlets. And so it ties into what Lowell said. So, I think that, we say I, no. I agree. I absolutely 100% agree with that. I, it doesn't mean you can't be friendly with people right. of the opposite sex or, or even friends on some level, but having someone that, to be your best friend of the opposite sex that you're not married to, I think um, if, if you're married, your best friend should be your spouse um obviously you know i have other guy friends in my life that are very close to me as well but my wife is my best friend she's my closest friend and uh and other females those of you here that are part of this family i'm going to treat you like sisters but not like best friends 
And so uh, I, I just 100% agree with that counsel. I think it's wise. One last thing with that, just thinking about like JD, I think um, with that, if you're in a, you know, maybe there's, I don't know, you think there's, you're faced with things throughout your life and it's deciding that you will not take yourself there. But I think also in a relationship, if you know both spouse, like say it's a married couple, if you know them both and you're wanting to send a message to the spouse, then send it to both. You know, it's not necessary yeah. to send to one person unless those parameters and there's boundaries. So it's kind of like what Joe said. We can sit here and talk about all these kind of boundaries and all these different questions, but. it's good. Um, next question. What, and this is, this is for the single people. What does a godly dating relationship look like? And so I'm going to throw this down to the Browns since you guys came out of that season the most recent than all of us. Well, I like that you guys talked about being best friends already. Um, cause that's actually what we wanted to talk about with, with dating. Um, our culture seems to combine dating into this big, emotional, bombastic thing that really... We've always seen dating and courting as two very different things that, that no one really talks about a lot. Dating being, um, in our opinion, you're just hanging out with a friend. You're trying to determine is there someone that, that we can be close friends. We're doing friendly things like you would do with any other friend. That's what dating is. <laughs> um, if you decide that you're compatible people that, that want to try something deeper and want to, want to work towards something like marriage, you move into something like courting. We're saying, okay, we, we are, we're working towards, towards a spiritual bond and we're working towards making each other better and ultimately bringing each other or, or edifying each other and bringing each other up so that on the day of judgment, um, we know that the other person can stand before God and, and be better than they were before they knew us. Um, that doesn't mean you have all of the, the luxuries and, um, and benefits of marriage. Obviously. Right. right. Um, yeah. It, it, you, you need to show humility. And you need to show these the attributes of, of caring for for your um, uh, for your partner. But physicality is such a small portion of that, and arguably not even supposed to be a portion of it at all. Um, um, what else do you have to add? Yeah. So I think um, <clears throat> just as far as the way culture views it versus uh, the way it should be, um, I think. One thing we we're talking about, you know, so often you see in movies when the guy's getting ready to propose and he doesn't even, you know, he's so nervous because he doesn't know whether or not the girl's going to say yes. Well, if that's, you know, an issue, then it's probably not <laughs> meant to be. Not, not time. Uh, it's not time yet. Yeah, we, we had a lot of honest conversations with one another about, you know, how many children or future goals, spiritual goals, and that kind of a thing. We won't, um, you don't want to shy away from that because you're nervous of their answer. We see that a lot with friends who are dating. Um, they're too nervous to ask those questions. Um, when really, you know, you want to find those out, like you were saying beforehand, because it's only going to magnify um, once you're married. Married, um, and so, yeah, you said a lot of what I was going to say. So <laughs> that's good. I I was reminded of the scripture that we just read in Colossians, where Paul says that we need patience, and uh, I think that applies a lot to not just within the marriage, but in, even the godly dating or courting relationships <laughs> there needs to be some patience of some things because like i said last week boyfriends don't get the same privileges as husbands do and so there's some boundaries and lines that you just need to set up for yourself that you don't cross until yeah go ahead one more thing um you might have heard this before but one thing we modeled our dating relationship after um is if you think of a, about a triangle and god's on top and you're down here in the corners the closer you grow to God should be the closer you're growing to each other. And so making God that number one priority. And then that's how we're going to grow, grow closer to each other in that way. So that's always good. Yeah, putting God first. Okay. We call it the Triforce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you, guys, you guys became best friends in that process. Yeah. And Robbie, mistake, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't have another girl that was your best friend as you were... <laughs> Right, okay, all right, so we see a pattern developing here. I got something to uh, kind of tag along with that. That's very rare, but it doesn't have to be, but that's very rare. And maybe everybody on the panel has had that experience, but Camille and I have not. Uh, she knew the Lord. We've been together actually 30 years, so um, I did not know the Lord. So she was liking a bad guy. 
I'm just going to put it out there. That's what it was. I didn't know I was bad. I just knew I was wrong. But uh, so, uh, you know, it says, you know, we, we're raising our girls to have godly relationships because I know the difference. Um, I was attracted to her and I was attracted to the goodness and the sweetness and it was all because of Jesus through her which I had no idea I've heard the name of the Jesus I've heard it but didn't I thought later on later on but um, I kept my life separate from her and so I looked up the word yoke and when you look it up is the synonym for that is uh, a control wheel and when you have two oxens on the yoke if they're not equally yoked you're going different ways and so that's how we were. We were going totally different ways, and yet we would meet right in the middle because we knew we loved each other. But we had a break. We had a breakup for a couple of years, almost two years. And I'm not going to sit here and share the whole testimony, but the Lord uh, grabbed a hold to me in a mighty way and because we were done. You know, we were done. And uh, brought us back together and redeemed us. And, and so for those of you who do not have or have not had godly relationships, get out of it and seek the Lord and you'll find your, your uh, godly person because a godly relationship is what you're looking for, not a perfect one. Mm. Even when, you, when you look at godly relationships, they got scars. You know, they're wounded. But you're going to get wounded in your relationship. For those of us who have been married for years, you've you got wounds. We may look like we don't, but there's wounds. There's deep wounds. And God has healed those wounds, but it's all about redeeming. You know, when He redeems you, you've been bought. You've been bought back. Back Amen. in the days when Coca Cola had the glass bottles. <laughs> I work for Coca Cola, just so you know. Don't put this on film. You get a bonus for this? Anyway. <laughs> Maybe. We do carry good products. Um, but back in the day when everything was glass, and you know, you could hear the trucks rattling because they had the, uh, the glass bottles were on top. I was just a kid. I didn't work for them then. But you could take those bottles to the store, and it was, you redeem, you know, it was a redeeming process. So the company would, you would get a nickel for them, and the company would take them back and wash them and reuse them. They would redeem those. It's called you redeeming those. So, you know, you're being bought back from your sinful nature. Anyway. Yeah, but I, I applaud those who have had godly relationships because that's what I want for my kids. Yeah, that would be the highest thing to shoot for, single people. Because Paul does instruct us; he sa- says that to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so, the highest thing you can shoot for is to find somebody that loves Jesus, is serving God, and those those are the kind of people that you want to keep your eyes out for. Uh, to go, hey, this is, this is the kind of person I want to be yoked to. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy. So we have to be equally yoked with him first. Amen to that. Yeah, it's good. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Is it okay to keep secrets from my spouse? Let's oh, back over here to you guys. Since I've talked. I mean, I can talk. <laughs> Camille. Um... So another one we were able to sit and talk about. So uh, this is probably our last one. So just know that, (laughs) or maybe, I don't know. But either way, so uh, we say no. And um, secrets are very dangerous. And let me share why. Um, We, Lowell's given this analogy before, but secrets are in the dark, right? And so what happens in the dark? Dark. Darkness there creates mold, infestation, and before you know it, it rots. But light comes in, and the redemption. Light comes in. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's okay. That's good, baby. Um, but light comes in and brings healing. Yeah. You know, Lowell has always used this analogy. We used to work with the youth a long time ago, and it was like, imagine going into a nightclub and somebody just flips on the switch, the light switch. What happens? They're going to they're gonna flee. Because anyway, so secrets. Now, I'm not talking about, um, like Lowell made a comment last night, like I've got a surprise, you know, like I'm right, planning yeah. something. Yeah. That's different. 
you know, um, Lowell said, well, that's a surprise. It's not a secret. So we're not referencing things like that. And we're not talking about, I've got to rehash my entire past and bring up things that are painful. If it's not benefiting the relationship in the marriage, you know, there are some things that just aren't beneficial. But if it's in the marriage, in the time frame of the marriage, secrets are just detrimental. So if you're in a place and you're holding a secret and you think, I just can't tell it because it's going to be detrimental, that is false. That's from the enemy. The enemy wants nothing more than you to keep a secret so you can stay defeated and you can stay down. Lowell was saying last night, it alters who you are. When you hold a secret, it alters who you are. You can no longer be yourself. You're always thinking about the secret. And I was telling him, there was this commercial when we were growing up that the Mormon church had. I don't know if anybody remembers it, but it's like you tell one lie, it leads to another. You tell two lies to cover each other. So it's like, you know, you get into this place of darkness. So my point is, I won't take too much longer with that, but secrets are just not good. And so think about that light, the healing that comes in when there is light. Christ is light. And he wants that for you. Can it be scary? Yes. But the freedom that comes with yeah. being truthful and honest, because the Lord can heal anything. If you hand it over, you bring that darkness to light and let that heal, it will happen. And so we say no secrets. The thing about, you know, here's the thing, you know, this is all about Jesus. I mean, it really is because he says, I am the light of the world. And those who follow me will not live in darkness, but have the light of life. And he is life. So, you know, when you're walking with the Lord and you have the, that light on you, there's no darkness. There should be no hidden secrets. There's not. You know why? Because it will be revealed. Some way. Some, it may take a week. It may take two years. But eventually it will be revealed because you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, then you're living in the presence of the Lord. We... we I sing about it you know I mean we got to live it you're in the kingdom next question um, the kids have grown up and left the house now what <laughs> look <Luchetics. laughs> okay so um, this answer is not just for all of us in the age group that your kids have left the house um, for those of you that have babies at home or don't even have kids yet this is something that you really need to put in your hope chest. Because one of the, um, the best things that I ever heard um, when our son was like little, 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 um, was that he is not yours. He is God's first. And so I think about um, Hannah when she prayed and she was blessed with Samuel. And she said, I will give him back. And so part of parenting is you are making disciples of all nations. The Great Commission starts with your household. But if you aren't careful, what is God's heart can get skewed a little bit to where it's almost true, but it's not God's truth. And you set your children up to be an idol above all else. Oh, wow. That you set up right your identity as a parent of raising your children, of how your kids... Um, behave, how they react, you know, the, the times that they're upset at God or they don't even know if they believe in God. It's like, oh, can you even like talk about that? Right. And so you take that on as like your identity, like how are you doing as a parent by what they're going through? But if you start out very early saying my only job is to be pleasing and honoring to the Lord and that my life is an offering you parent very differently. You don't have this like badge of worth based on how your kids are growing in their relationship with God. And so what ends up happening is when they're babies, even before you have kids, you are already in your mind, lining your mind and your heart up with the will of the Father that we will show our kids your heart. And the best thing that can happen is that when your kids do leave home, that they are equipped to leave home. You will do your children a disservice if all you think about is, I don't want you to leave, I don't want you to leave, I don't want you to leave. Because what you're doing is you're actually squelching who God is calling them to be. You are to be their launching pad. 
with, with whatever they need. And so one of the things that, because we work with a lot of young adults, is that we find that a lot of parents, that they start saying hurtful things without realizing they're saying hurtful things. I can't wait till you all leave so I can like change your bedroom. Wait until you're all out of the house. I cannot tell you how many times like people say that and maybe joking, but a lot of times they're not. And so what they end up is they start making their children feel that, wow, this, this whole 18 years that we've had you or whatever it is, that really it's been a bother and we're counting down. If you have kids out of the house, you need to know your job is not done because they don't live with you because you are a Christ follower first. So you are still to be like your life, the way that you live it as an offering to be that example to your children. If your kids, I don't care if your kids are 40 years old, you have this role in their life to be a constant, to just be a home-based constant, that you are cheering for them, that you are in their corner, but you don't need to control them. And really, when you keep that mindset, even as they're growing up, you're not parenting out of control, but you are parenting out of discipleship. And it, it's a game changer. I don't know if that's what you're looking That's for. fantastic. <laughs> Dean, yeah, I'll add to sure. that. Um, so, you know, being married 24 years, now going on 25 this year, um, we have, as a couple, as a family, have gone through many different seasons of our life. And this is just a new season. Cert it certainly is an exciting season for me. Um, being a grandpa, still working on that name, haven't decided it yet. Um, but so I look back over these 24 years and, and, and I can say, you know, just from the very beginning, Renee, as uh, we started and, you know, a little under two years later, we had Caleb and then, you know, ministry began to start. And then uh, in 2008, you know, God spoke to Renee and I on the very same day that we were supposed to move from Pennsylvania. Wow, that was scary. Um, and then, you know, a year later, uh, uh, Renee was on staff at, you know, down the street here in this little role, and then it grows to this unbelievable thing. And then God moves us out of that, and, and now here we are at Seeds. And so um, I think my advice to all of you, to everyone in this room, embrace the season that you're in. Um, listen to where God is placing you where he's telling you to go and um, trust him in everything. When you trust him um, and you're walking out exactly where you're supposed to be, uh, that season will be the best season at that time for you. Fantastic. That's good. We'll do, uh, we'll wrap it up here with like a two in one kind of question. And I'd like to just everyone kind of chime in on this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out answer, but the question is, what's the one greatest piece of wisdom you'd give to a married couple or a single person? What's the one greatest piece of wisdom that you would give? And so I can think of a lot of one greatest. So, you know, don't feel like, <laughs> I've got to say all 17 things that are amazing. Think of just the one thing and go with that. It'll be all right. So, Robbie, we'll start down here with you, and we'll just come down the line. Um, sure, I've got a piece of advice for the single people, actually. We didn't discuss this beforehand, but um, be content in the Lord before you try to find contentment with oh, another good. person. That's good. Uh, we both found each other, and we know lots of people that have found each other. Once we stopped looking for dating relationships and started focusing on God, and that's mm -hmm. when he said, all right, you're, you're ready for the next step. You have to be. Lindsay. That's good. Um, I think not just with marriage, but even then friendships. Um, I'm just going to go back to the word humility. Um, we were just talking about this in our city group. Um, when you think about your spouse or your friend facing Christ on that judgment day, you know, helping them prepare for that. Um, when you live your life in a more humble manner, you know, all of a sudden when I get mad at him for not taking out the trash, that doesn't matter. That's trivial. When I think about, you know, what... What can I be doing? How can I be serving Him and loving Him to prepare Him to meet um, our Savior? Um, and then same thing with your friendships. You know, how can you love them and serve them um, in that way with, you know, that in, in your mind? Um, just being more humble. And, and instead of trying to win conversations and win fights, 
and win arguments, try to outdo each other with love and service. Oh, that's good. Um, obviously, God be a Christian, that would be my greatest bit of advice. <laughs> um, but besides All right, let's that, go home. <laughs> maybe something more, less supernatural, maybe more natural, is if you want to have friends, be a friend. It's a very silly statement, but if you're complaining you don't have friends, you're probably not a very good friend, just to be honest. Um, how do you be humble? How do you use humor? How do you pray for them? And are you seeking for relationships that are positive, or are you the negative person? So my bit of advice is Jesus. Yay! Second is um, to have friends, be a friend. Um, for married people, out of our relationship, some advice I would give is to focus on how you're similar because we are very different you know he's from New Hampshire and I'm from Alabama and he was raised Catholic and I was raised several versions of Baptist but but <laughs> I mean, but we we had some periods of time where that was our focus was how how different we are and at some point we realized we're way more alike than we give ourselves credit for and by focusing on that similarity it's really brought us closer together and those differences just don't matter as much um, and then for single people we were married at 24, so I, you know, I wasn't single for very long. What I wish I had had time for is the, those bad habits that you have, those um, bad choices that you've made. You, um, you have time as a single person to work on those things and to give those to God and let Him work in you. Because once you're married, this has come up a few times, that just gets exacerbated. It's not just your issue anymore. It's your issue. So, you know, whatever that habit is that is, is bringing you, that's hurting you, that's a problem in your life, if you can deal with that and really give it to God and work through that, it will make your marriage even better and, and start you out on a much stronger foundation. That's good. Um, well, Joe took mine with Jesus, uh, so I have to come up with another one. No. Yeah. No, uh, I, I think this, was, this would be for married people or single people. But put yourself in the right community. Um, we, we say this around here. We make a lot of like agricultural analogies around here. With a name like Seeds Church, you just have to. But it, there, there's plenty in Scripture. And one of, the, one of the pictures that we've talked about before is, is that community is like soil. And it matters if your seed, if your life is a seed, it matters what kind of soil that you plant yourself in. Uh, it's going to determine... Uh, it's going to determine how you grow. I saw this, um, I was talking about this, I think with my dad a few weeks ago. And he was telling me that uh, he was somewhere and they, he saw a row of these same trees that were planted. These same trees in someone's yard. And they were just planted in this nice, fine little row. But not all of the trees, and they were all planted on the same day, but not all of the trees were the same height and at the same maturity. It's because as the, tro as the trees were planted down this row, they, they hit different kinds of soil. The richness of soil were a little bit different. And it affected the maturity of those trees. And so some of the trees were flourishing and some of them were struggling. And so it matters. It makes a difference what kind of community that you surround yourself with, whether you're a married person or a single person. Um, I think this is, primarily for single people, but then it leads right into a marriage. Um, years ago, I used to read a lot of stuff by Miles Monroe, and he um, explained being single is this, you don't need someone to complete you. And so God has created you with everything you need on the inside of you. And Miles Monroe would say, you are looking for someone who is separate, unique, and whole, and you need to be separate, unique, and whole. So when you come together, you don't need each other, you want each other. And um, this kind of sounds like I'm contradicting you, but I'm not contradicting you, I promise. Because we do have a lot of similarities, but we are actually very, very different. And we even were just laughing about it last night. Like She's orange blue, I'm green gold. If you don't know That's what that the means. complete opposites on the color. We, yeah. We're, we're yeah. like, you know, if you ever play those games where it's like, would you rather go to the beach? Or to the mountains, we separate. Would you rather drive a Ferrari or an SUV? We separate. Like we, every decision, it seems that there's so many differences, but that doesn't scare us. Right. It makes life kind of fun. That like 
it's a constant adventure of trying to learn each other and that it's okay that I love to paint and he doesn't want anything to do with it or that I love and I love that she loves to paint and he likes blues go for it it's okay right and so um, I think it's important as a single person that you go forward becoming separate unique and whole and being happy with who you are and allowing a separate unique and whole person to come alongside you and you make this like amazing beautiful tapestry of differences that come together and create beauty. So um, I would just speak to that and say, even in a marriage, just because you get married doesn't mean the two do become one, obviously, but inside your marriage, if you're not exactly the same, it's okay. That's okay, that doesn't have to scare you. Let it be part of the journey and be okay with it. It's good. Um, I think for whether married or single, that at the end of the day, the beginning of the day, and all the minutes in between, right, um, is what would kingdom on earth look like? What would kingdom on earth look like in this relationship, in this moment? And what can I do to reflect kingdom on earth? And so it means all of those things like tied up that they are saying of in that moment, what really matters? In our culture, we think certain things of what you get so upset about, you know what I mean? Like Lindsay said about like taking out the trash. You know, every marriage has had fights and every family about trash. I don't understand, <laughs> um, but it's true. You know, but in our culture, we live in like the nice, like you take out like the glad trash bags and then you fight, why didn't you put a bag in? Do you know what I mean? That's just what happens. We could tell some stories, um, Renee, right. come on. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time. I'm telling you, you need to take that trash bag. <laughs> 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 but, but really, at the end of the day, those are such cultural things. Like, we should be thankful we have, like, glad trash bags, right? All of us, like, clean fridge. We're like, yes. Okay. But really, kingdom on earth, what does it look like? And what can we do to bring that in and to love the other person well? And for those of you that are single, you need to know what kingdom, what the kingdom on earth looks like is not always you having to be focused on marriage. Paul says sometimes it is better for you to be single. And so that would be my advice to you. Don't seek God's kingdom for you and what he has for you, not to reflect what everybody around you looks like. That was good, Renee. <laughs> it's being walked out by some people right here in this church, young people, so look around. Uh, real practical advice. Um, Real, I'm trying not to look at you guys, actually, right, because you're awesome. I love every one of you people up there. You love Jesus so much with your heart, and I appreciate that very much, yeah. especially these three right here. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so real practical advice. Uh, we're human. We make mistakes. We have the forgiveness of Jesus, right? Admit when you're wrong. You may make the same mistake more than once, but be quick to try to change that and forgive your spouse. Forgive your spouse when they walk it out. If it wasn't, yes, when she doesn't take out the trash. And thank you, Renee, for being so quick to forgive me. That's good. Well, I love that, Jane, because that was um, something that we've really reflected on. It's just... <laughs> That's, Lol, that's does Coke day. make trash bags? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm sick. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm very blue, by the way. <laughs> um, anyway, so just staying in a state of forgiveness and whatever, that can be the small things and the big things. Those big things can really bring detriment. And so you just ha if you stay in that, that mind frame of forgiveness at all times, and it goes back to the scripture that J.D. shared, so... Thank you, Dean, for even bringing that up. And, you know, it just lets you know that that's such a key element. And that can look like so many things. But forgiveness is so big. You think of what Christ has done for us. Like, it, it's just this beautiful, huge picture. And because of that, it's seeking peace. So seek peace at all times within your relationship. Don't stay in those states of turmoil. Because when you're seeking peace, forgiveness comes with that. <laughs> And so I think that's something we've just really tried to strive in our relationships is that even through our conflict, our end result is peace. We're trying to seek peace together. So that's fine. Yep. 
So this is for all you single. Well, both singles are up front. Wow. So um, this is for both single and married. Um, I don't know why, but this analogy comes to me. A river is only as strong as its banks. Uh, without banks, it's a swamp. And so that goes back with community and who you surround yourself with. You know, who's going to be lifting you up, praying for you. And, uh, you know, that someone you can come to in your struggles because, look, you're struggling with something. I don't care. If you're alive, you're struggling with something. It may be big. It may be small. But even the small things affect you. So the advice I have for married people, men, step up. Be a man. Be who God called you to be. Be a leader of your home. Uh, spiritual, spiritually. Um, you know, I'm pointing to myself, trust me. Pray for your wife. Pray with your wife because that's hard. I remember when we first started praying for each, with, each, with each other. That was like so awkward. I mean, it was like, you start. No, I start. You start. You start. And we were like, okay, one, two, three, go. This is when we first started. You know, we, I mean, it was crazy. It was like, it was just so foreign because it is. It's foreign to pray with each other because you feel like you're just weird, you know. But that's power, man. You get to know your wife spiritually, and that's intimacy, and that's different than anything else. So... When you get to that point and, you, and you're able to pray with your wife, not just for her, but with her, uh, it sets a statement. It also affects your kids, you know, because when you bring the presence of the Lord in your house, He's not just in one room. He's in the whole house. You can't just have Him, you know, just in the corner somewhere. He, he's, he wants the whole house. And not to react, you know, when you hear bad news or any kind of news, don't let the first thing come out of your mouth, note to self. I'm not looking at anybody. But don't react. Um, take it to the Lord. Take it, you know, and stew on it. And then God will give you the way to handle those things. Um, just a little short uh, tidbit this morning. So, you know, the, the Lord wanted us here, but the enemy did not. Trust me. He did not want us to come here today. And because... You know, I'm, our bedroom is upstairs. I hear Camille saying, Lowell, come, come here. I'm like, I was still in the bed. I'm like, okay. The tone of her voice was made me get up. And the stove was on fire. Uh, we had pulled it out, and, I mean, there were, like, flames and sparks on the back of the stove. I mean, so what? I mean, our house is going to be on fire? So uh, I just knew immediately. You know, immediately I knew, you know. So we just kind of... You know, laughed it off, and then when we go to the car, you put the fire yeah. out too, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, oh yeah, I unplugged it. As I was, look, I stepped up as a man, and I unplugged it. You know, I could have backed off, said, "You do it." No, you do it. No, I unplugged it at the same it. time. One, two, two three. three. <laughs> yes, that's the only way to do it. Yeah. But uh, so we're getting ready to go out in the car and she's got her little umbrella and she's kind of, you know, keeping me from getting wet. And I'm like, I'm good. But so we get to the car. I said, I'll drive. And her window is down and the seat is soaking wet. And I'm like, OK, there's another one. So I knew I said, well, so I went back in, got a towel. And when I got back in, we couldn't do anything but just laugh because we knew that the enemy was trying to get us upset. Because we could have been very upset, you know, with, you know, every little thing that, that, that happens can come back to make you lash out at each other or just say something that may, you know, be rude or offensive. But, you know, we had, we, we just laughed at it, you know. We, we're at, you, when you get to that point, you know what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to deter us from coming here and being able to speak to you guys, not that we are, you know, I don't know. You may walk out and be like, that guy's not right. But <laughs> anyway, so we hope that whatever you get out of this today is that you know that, one, I brought my Bible up here is because um, it's, your, it's your sword. It's, it's the Word of God. It's, it's who you are in Him. 
and he says that he will make you new and if you don't believe that I, I, I highly recommend you try it it's not just knowing the word it's knowing the God of the word because Amen. you know Bible knowledge is great but you know if you don't know the word if you don't know the God of the word you know it changes your life yeah it changes who you are it changes our relationship with each other because I know the difference between um, not having the Lord and having the Lord. So, yeah, yeah. just surround yourself with, with people that are like-minded, you know, Christ-minded people. And I promise you, you, you will be safe. And that, you know, look, you're going to have struggles. You're going to have problems. It's okay. Laugh at it, you know. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Kind of about... It's our generation, one thing we talked about, grew up with Parks and Rec and Office and those kind of shows. And so we've grown up with this, you know, being sarcastic with one another. And it would have been really easy for, you know, Lowell in that situation to say something sarcastic to Camille about leaving her window down. Um, you know, that's something us being young. Like, it's, we do that. We, we are sarcastic with each other. But that's not, that's not from the Lord. That's from the enemy. And that's, that's those fights are going to creep in. So instead of throwing out that sarcastic comment, because, you know, the Office and Parks and Rec are really funny and it's funny. It's not, and it leads to arguments, and yeah, I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. We prayed beforehand today that it wouldn't just be like human wisdom that would be coming out, that whatever came out of us today would be Holy Spirit breathed. And so we pray that um, maybe it was something we said that wasn't even exactly what we said, but the Holy Spirit sparked something inside of you today that was just wisdom for yourself and relationships, and it helped shape the way you see God and helped the way you see yourself and see others. And that's, that's what we want as we walk together. We want to be this new you, new relationships, not doing it the way that the world does it. I, I was just curious, and I just kind of Googled, like, most asked relationship questions. And I came across a couple of different articles that showed, like, uh, not in 2018, but the 2017 most searched questions about relationships on Google. And I was just astonished <laughs> by what some of these questions were and it just is it gave me a little bit of insight into our culture of just how far they are from God and how their view of relationships are so far from God's way of doing things and I'm not I'm not trying to create a divide and say well it's us versus them kind of thing no it just it gave my heart compassion for the for the rest of the world of going man God help me I want to do relationships with God your way. I want to do it your way in my marriage so that it can be a conduit of your light and your love to the rest of the world that I come in contact to, who are hurting, who are broken, who have no clue, who are asking the craziest things about relationships that that, that even shouldn't be an issue or just, just insane stuff. But God... Help me strengthen our relationship so it can shine the light of Christ and help help save others. That's my heart, our desire for all the relationships here at Siege Church, whether you're single, whether you're married. Um, God's got good plans for us. Amen. Hey, before we, we just dismiss, I want to remind you, coming up Wednesday, it's, it's Ash Wednesday, it's the beginning of Lent. Go and use those resources on our website. Um, we're going to start praying together every single day with a, with a prayer, specific prayer topic and you don't have to spend a long time, but we've got scriptures that are attached to each and every one of those. And, uh, and, and if you can, come out Wednesday, be there. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give our lives to you as an offering. We are living sacrifices, God. And it's our pleasure and it's our honor and it's our joy to live for you, to live our lives as a, as a sacrifice. Uh, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you you make us your living temples, that you live on the inside of us. We ask you for your help. We we yield to your leadership in this area of relationships, God. Um, We we don't just want to align ourselves with the way that the rest of the world does relationships, with the way we see it modeled in the media, on television, on movies, and and wherever else, God, in, in our workplaces where people come into work and they're their marriages are, are trashed or they're sleeping around or they're uh, just whatever it is, God, whatever scenario that, that's not your way of doing it, God, we want to be an influence 
on the culture. So Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, to stir up revival on the inside of Seeds Church. Stir up revival on the inside of this body, this local body, God, so that it spills out into the culture and it causes uh, a change in society around us. Lord, we just pray that you would even do that through every part of us, even our relationships. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling in relationship issues. Lord, I pray that they would find somebody, the right people, godly people to, to talk to, to bear their soul to, that they can walk with them through these issues and come out victorious. In the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Amen.